everybody. Welcome to the Art of Transformation, stories of transformation and tools to get you there. Today, we talk with Dr. Tamsin Astor. Dr. Astor is the chief habit scientist, and she's been through all kinds of transformations, many of which she shares on the podcast. She's actually even in one now. And she shares the three things that she knows from her research on how to get through these transformations so that you're better on the other side, the best version of yourself. So let's get to the episode and thank you for growing with us. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Art of Transformation, stories of transformation and tools to get you there. I'm your host, Mark Sheff, and I am here with a new friend, special guest, uh, compatriot in the coaching world. Tamsin, Dr. Tamsin Astor is a PhD in cognitive neuroscience, uh, has a book out called Force of Habit, Unleashing Your Power by Developing Great Habits. I have notes here. That's why I'm looking over here. Um, she's also the mom of three neurospicy kids, including a cancer survivor. Uh, she, and I'm going to actually, Tamsin, welcome to the show. I'm going to let you introduce yourself probably a bit more than I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Mark. I'm super excited for our conversation. Um, I am the chief habit scientist, so I help people create the daily habits that connect their big, juicy life and business vision. But it goes a little bit deeper than that, thanks to your um, fabulous conversation with me. Um, it's more about helping people unhide those parts of themselves that they felt like they had to conform, particularly in our society of shoulding and masturbation. Um, I'm a Londoner. Masturbation, um, I, in... I like that. Masturbation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, don't we all masturbate right. I, on such I, a regular basis? <laughs> yeah, and I, I have a, I, another one that I like is is that we shouldn't should all we should not should all over ourselves. A song by Wookie Foot that like that don't should on yourself and yeah. like and it's really bad for the health of your friends to should on your friends as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I'm a Londoner. I live in the US, lived in the US for 21, nearly 22 years. It'll be 22 years in March. Um, wow. And I love to travel and I love coffee and food and live music and, if, and juicy conversations, idea sex with people. So if I can weave all of that together, the travel, the music, the food, the conversation, yum. It just gets yeah. even better. <laughs> Well, I'm kind of curious to dig into that because that you brought it up and it's something that we talked about in, in one of our previous conversations uh, about how you look at duality, how you are able mm. to hold duality. Tell, tell me kind of about what that is and also kind of what the impact is on somebody, you know, who, who might work with you or experience your work in some way. Uh, t tell us a little bit more about that du holding of duality. So the holding of duality is something that I've spent my life doing um, in that I grew up in homes where, you know, in a home where, not in homes, in a home where, or navigating the homes of people maybe, where we talked about psychoanalysis. My father was a Jungian analyst. We talked about lots of art. We talked about um, the data and science of the world. My uncle's an OBGYN. So we had this interesting combination of like the logic, the math, the data, the science, with art and creativity. And my grandmother was psychic and was into aromatherapy and homeopathy in the 70s when like those were, were sort of things that were kind of unusual <laughs> in a well, lot of the world. And, and to be clear, like you have a story about that. Could you, would you mind telling it? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is one of those extraordinary stories, which to me felt completely normal in the home that I grew up. So when I was 11, I started taking the classic red London bus to school on my own, the ones that you could jump on and off. And um, buses have this tendency to either arrive all together. So I managed to run to the stop and all of my friends got on the bus and it went off. And so I had to jump on the one that came after. And what I didn't realize was that the stop that was closest to my school was a request stop i.e the bus only stopped there if you rang the bell so i'm standing there got my backpack on and my school uniform on the bus flies past the bus stop so i get up in a vague state of panic because i was very driven by like following those right rules when i was a little girl and i grabbed hold and leant out to look where was the next bus stop the next thing i knew i was walking along the street blood pouring down my face. I didn't know my name, didn't know what the day of the week was. And then my next memory was sitting in a stranger's living room. 
with them going, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? What's your phone number? While this was going on, my grandmother called my mother and said, something has happened to her. You need to call the school. My mother called the school and said, she first said to my grandmother, like, don't be crazy. She went off to school, it's fine. And my grandmother was like, no, no, something's happened. You need to call the school. So my mother called the school and found out that I'd never showed up. So then the search began, where, where was Tamsin? Mm. And after repeatedly, apparently I repeatedly came up with the wrong phone number, the wrong phone number, the wrong phone number, didn't know my name, didn't know my name. And after they kept asking me, they found, they luckily found my name and then they took me to the ER, which um, and my mother met me there. Um, so that was this sort of one of those first stories and I many more of my psychic grandmother, but that was perfectly normal in conjunction with the logic, the science, the data, <laughs> you know, mm. and everything else. So how does that work into the work that you do as chief habit scientist? So I am comfortable helping people hold the duality of where they are right now and where they want to be, that mm. they are complete and whole, even if they're in a state of transition, even if they're in a state of pain, even if they're in a state of growth. So holding the now with the, this is where you want to go. Holding the duality of quantitative and qualitative data to understand how you feel and show up, right? So with my clients, I'll talk about, you know, what is the number on the scales? What's the net amount in the bank account? Like what is the concrete data that is in alignment with what we're talking about? And then what is the qualitative data? How do you feel when you do or don't do these things? Mm. And how do those two relate to each other? Because we have a society that so often focuses on quantitative data. Like what is the, what is the stuff that we can see? And we're so badly educated. And I think we do a terrible disservice to our children in terms of how do I feel about what I'm doing or not doing? And what does that information tell me about how I'm living in alignment with my juicy vision for my life, my business, the kinds of relationships I want, the kind of body I want to have, the kind of home I want to have. There's a, the question that's coming up for me around that is, um, okay, uh, I think, uh, and, and there's some science that maybe just came out or just sort of came into my radar that, um, some financial institution, maybe it was like the Kennedy Center at Harvard or something that that did a, a study on how decisions are made. You know, mm -hmm. they looked at like, you know, big hedge funds, finance firms, like Harvardy stuff. Um, and uh, and they found, no surprise, that no matter what kind of logic there is behind a decision, all decisions, the origin of all decisions is is emotional. It's feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. and we can we can say, and you and you you know and you hear this all the time even in the corporate world well why did you do that i don't know i just had a feeling about it and i can now go back and say oh this is the logic and whatever but it's all, and even when someone says this is just a logical decision there's still a feeling that's driving that a feeling of i you know what is it that you want from you know what is driving your logic you're yeah. moving towards a feeling of safety success you know what, mm -hmm. whatever it is mm -hmm. um what would you, that's, maybe I just sort of spoiled it, but like, that's what I would kind of say to people who are like, oh, you know, I, I, I try not to, you know, let my emotions guide my feelings. What is the benefit of accepting that and, and using that knowledge to actually drive more, as you said, kind of in alignment decisions? What does that actually get someone? Depending on who you talk to, you have to figure out the way that they understand that concept, right? So some people will talk about it as intuition, some mm. religious people might talk about it as like God is talking to me or the universe is talking to me or spirit is talking to me. So some people, you know, will see that as, you know, like slowing down and getting quiet and allowing that information in. So the way the benefit is that that information will often guide more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? More. You'll you'll make less mistakes when you follow that. <laughs> right so often we're driven by the like the logical thing to do right we're driven by the thing that makes sense rather than the thing that feels right but one of the things that we fail to do in society particularly we see that with 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 girls when they start to you know go into that stage of puberty is that we're told to shut down right mm. we're told not to we're told not to you know, like even just sort of classic, like kiss your uncle hello on the cheek rather than like, do you feel safe kissing this person who might to you feel like a stranger on the on the cheek, right? Like 
we start to train people to shut that down. And what that often does is, is we start losing trust in ourselves. And it's hard to take action when you're not doing it from a place of self-trust. So the, the benefit I see and that I see with my clients is when they start to listen to that gut feeling, that little voice inside the universe, God, intuition, however you want to phrase it, they create self-trust. And when they create self-trust, they like themselves more, they feel happier, and they are, they just feel like they are making decisions from a place of deep inner knowing rather than because there's this external pressure. And tangentially related to this is in our society, there's a pressure for continued action, right? And I was having this conversation this morning with my coach about how I'm in a state of transition right now. And I'm feeling pressured because of, you know, living in this world of like, what's my next goal? What's my next, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm working on sitting with the, I don't know what my next step is and that's okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right and doing that is going to create self-trust in me rather than going i need to take the next step because that's what's expected of me right like the like the kissing the uncle on the cheek this is the thing that's expected um you know it doesn't necessarily fit with who i am or what i want or what i'm comfortable with and if you learn to like i, I like what you're saying here if you learn to sort of tamp that down then you know, you might make decisions, and and we see this all the time. People who make decisions that will lead them towards, you know, success. The, you know, how to how to ten x your thing, and the one weird trick, and you know, do you know, do all these things. Um, the thing that really, <laughs> the thing that really lights me up, I'm hearing from you, is is when you're having that conversation and saying, okay, so what is behind that? Mm -hmm. What is it? Okay, so so you get all that, you get all that success, uh, you know, money, fame, whatever, you know, you know, whatever it is that you're that you're looking mm -hmm. for what is it that you're looking for? What does that get you? Yeah. Oh, I get to have all these, but, but it always in my experience and maybe yours always comes back to how someone wants to feel at the end of the day. Yeah. I, and and yeah. it's, and it's crazy. Like we're sitting here talking about feelings, but if we can identify, I totally agree. If we can identify what that end feeling is for ourselves and yeah, for the mm -hmm. others around us, mm -hmm. I feel like, like you, I, what, what I'm hearing is that there's that Yes, that's self-trust, which also mm -hmm. means that other people trust us. So when we trust ourselves yeah. and are acting in alignment with ourselves, yeah. other people see that and there's a feeling of trust, which if exactly. you want to get really, you know, sort of Machiavellian or capitalist about it, like if people trust me, there's connections that can be made. There's there's work that might be gotten. There's, you know, there's things that we can do together that I can do with someone who I trust versus someone who I, you know, who who, who I don't <laughs> I don't yeah. know I don't know where their decisions are coming from. So I can't right. I, I kind of want to stay away. Right. Right. No, and that's absolutely true. And I think the other kind of piece in relation to this is the is that the more that we can live from that ourselves, the more connection we create around us that is deeply authentic. So, you know, for example, when I, you know, when I led our call on Friday, you know, that group of us who we all came together from brilliant being in brilliant the same move. space. Thank you. I was <laughs> welcome, but I mean, I was struck by by how safe everybody felt, mm. being deeply vulnerable, right? And I reflected over the weekend, like what had I done in the setup of that, you know, to create that because it was very deeply moving to me how how comfortable and vulnerable everybody felt in that space, and I think that what I took away from that was that because I was comfortable being deeply vulnerable myself and like I showed up in the, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I believe in. And I'm in this state right now of not knowing exactly where I'm going with this, that, and the other. So QED, you can all share that too. Right. And so the point I think about this is that the more we can tap into how we're feeling. And for me, that came through, being diagnosed with complex PTSD and my talk therapist saying, you got to stop talking your way through this and thinking your way through this. You've got to feel your way through this. <laughs> Which I was like, so what are we doing here? Yeah. I, yeah. He's like, he's like, Cody, yeah, I'm going to buy you for a little bit. You need to go and work with therapists who can help you feel your way through this. You got and not fired by your therapist. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, 
but that's you know that really is the thing right you know i've heard this quote recently in the relation to this like if you want to change the way people behave you need to change the way they think if you want to change the way people think you need to change the way they feel right and that's what how these are all related right and as a buddhist of a decade like you know that's a large fundamental part of being a buddhist is you know thinking about that connection between your beliefs your thoughts your actions and that's then who you are as a human and how you show up and being responsible for looking at those connections right how has that influenced um how is that the the buddhist side how has that influenced uh your transformation over the past you know five ten years so the thing that for me has been the huge part of buddhism is is learning to be friends with my mind so one of the things that i found um irritating about sort of classic christianity was the um i'm going to be forgiven my sins every week clean slate but there was no deep reflection on why had i gone down that thought pathway and said those things to somebody and hurt them why had i failed to stand up for myself in this situation it was just like oh you're forgiven for this thing and that frustrated me and i discovered buddhism as part of my yoga teacher training about 15 years ago um and i happened to do one that was steeped in buddhism rather than in hinduism um and the kind of common thread was how can i be helpful and that was how the Buddhism was in initially introduced. And the more I dug into Buddhism, what I really understood was that it was about me making friends with my own mind. And the more I could understand my own mind and reflect on how my mind operated. So when I'm still and meditating, does my mind tend to go towards everything will be better when I lose 10 pounds, when I'm in that perfect relationship, mm, when I get that mm. particular person in my life, when I get the grant, when I buy that house, when I get the car, you know, does it go to the future? Or do I sit there and go, why did I do that? Like past regret, 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 right? What does my mind do when I'm not filling it? So I get to know my mind and I get comfortable with my mind. And the other thing that meditation has done a huge, which is a sort of large part of my Buddhist practice is, is the, the classic, you know, Frankl quote, the Viktor Frankl quote of the gap between stimulus and response is your source of greatest freedom. Mm. And you know, my PhD examined the conscious awareness of reaction. My PhD thesis was intention and reactivity in cognitive neuroscience. And it's sort of ironic that I was doing that in the late 90s, given what I do now, right? But this idea of like, when stimulus arises, whether it's, you know, the dog barking, the kid going, mom, 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 dad, 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 the client knocking at the door, right? Or the internal, why did I say this? What do I do? Like, where's my to do this? Did I lose my keys? Well, going huh and then i'm going to take action or not rather than immediately going into it right and that for me has been the biggest gift because it allows me to show up in a state of intentionality rather than reactivity mm. there's a lot that that is hitting on i'm thinking back to a lot of my coach training and and coaching experience that um that silence that you can create with someone and uh, not be in a rush to fill it. Sometimes, sometimes that is where so much <laughs> work happens. There's a there's a TED talk that I just watched. And I forced my son to watch it. He's 13, <laughs> um, and he wanted to come home early from school one day. And I it was like it was just sort of study hall, and he had done everything already. I was like, you can come home, but um, you have to sit with me and watch this TED Talk. It's 17 minutes. You have to sit and watch it with me together at home. That's the deal. Fine, fine. Comes home. Um, and it's this TED Talk. You can find it. It's on uh, It's on boredom and what happens when we're bored, mm -hmm. which is maybe also what happens when we meditate or sit quietly. I mean, boredom looks a lot like maybe staring at the ceiling. Um which I've said for many, many years that staring at the ceiling is a very important part of my creative process uh, for hours. You know, what happens according to this uh, scientist, the, the research that they did was that, you know, our brain goes into default mode and mm -hmm. default mode is when uh, the right brain kind of gets to play. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not, we're not focused in on solving a problem. 
our okay. brain is sort of expanded out and it might not feel that way. Like you might feel like you're looping on something and that might be, mm -hmm. that might be happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, this is just what the right brain does is it, is it's, is it kind of takes a big picture of you and says, Oh, you know, it'd be neat if we took that over there and put it with that over there and mash mm -hmm. those things up. And mm -hmm. like, that, mm -hmm. that is kind of the source of creativity for, for a lot of what we do. So it makes complete sense to me that that silence would create so much possibility uh, yeah. and trans and transformation for you, for your clients. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And that, and to your point about, you know, the boredom piece is that's a real struggle in our modern society because we are taught to fill, 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 consume, consume, consume. And the problem with that is it leaves very little space to create those connections you know which yeah. is so vital to who we are like I was thinking about what you were saying to your to about to your son like I can imagine like how many people would kids would be like yeah I'll sit next to you and watch that while I'm on my phone dad. Yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> well you know it's but I think I saw a stand-up I, I watch a, a lot of stand-up comedy most I watch a lot of clips and I watch a lot of specials and there's I forget the guy's name um but he was like he was talking about meditation and maybe Buddhism and he's like He's like, you know, uh, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I think about, you know, my kid, you know, if he doesn't have someone, he's like, I'm bored. And I was like, so like, how much time did we spend, like, go outside and sit and stare at the clouds? I, I'm like a Zen master. Like, you know, we, we talk, he was saying that we talk so much about mindfulness now, mindfulness, like we have to get back to mindfulness. It's like, we were real good at this as kids. Like no one talked about mindfulness in the nineties, but like, man, we were doing it because we didn't have all this shit to like distract us. <laughs> um, somebody else, you go look up the comedian. I don't want to steal his, his stuff, but, um, but getting back to, um, getting back to mindfulness and, um, and how that can create transformation. I know that you've, you've, you've experienced, and I mean, you've acknowledged you're sort of in the middle of a, of a transformation right now. Maybe there's something there that you can, that you can share with our vast audience. Um, <laughs> well, you know, all, all five of them, um, you know, <laughs> what what is something that you're doing you're in the middle of this like you're yeah. you're discovering a new path you're doing a lot already you've got you know you you you've got all these <laughs> you've got books and phd's and all these things so what is it tell, tell us a little bit about this transformation as you're aware of it in the moment so as i'm in this transition right now what i'm working on is the sort of the visual i have is the eye of being the eye of the storm so mm. I'm sitting here and, you know, I'm in a state where I don't know where my three children will be living come August. So that feels quite destabilizing. Yeah. Right. So there's that spinning around me and I'm redefining, you know, what my business looks like and the way it's structured because my children's lives are changing. Um, I am planning on moving at the end of this year. So there's a lot of stuff that is swirling around me. And so as I'm in this state of transformation, one of the things that I'm holding on to is this mantra, which I got from Rob Bell when I went to see Liz Gilbert and Rob Bell at Omega last summer. I'm on Tamsin time. <laughs> I am on Tamsin time. I'm not on anybody else's time, you know, because there's this pressure to be like, okay, you're redefining your niche. You're re you're building your speaking business. Who's this? Game? You know, fuck <laughs> that, right. I've got to shut that down and I can feel that because I am somebody that, you know, I have like nine certifications. I've been a busy human in the last 10 years, you know, since I moved into this world, you know, I haven't sat on my ass, right? But I'm in a space of going, this all feels very different and I'm transforming. So the first is to give myself the permission to say, I am on my own schedule. I am on my own time frame, and I have no clue what that's going to look like. And that's okay, right? So that's the first. Being, <laughs> right? being okay, being okay with, not knowing and i know it sounds so like oh yeah like woo woo whatever yeah. but i mean i think about like when i when I, i'm working with i'm working with somebody who's like a brand expert and looking to kind of you know do his own thing um and and there's a lot of not knowing um and and you know we're all kinds of people i mean i can give you you know examples from probably every everybody that i've worked with and there's a lot of like, well, I don't, I don't know how that's going to go, or I don't even really know exactly what I, I, I want here. And I think you said it, like we live in a society where it's like, you got to know, you got to go out and get your crush your goals and get 10x, all this stuff. And it's like, 
Ooh, like mm -hmm. what yeah. if I just took a minute and gathered some information and so and and gave my gave my my default mode a little time to actually put it together in a way that makes the most sense yeah exactly exactly so that's that's the first piece that i think is really key when you're in a state of transformation is doing it on your own time scale and it's like grief you know i've had a few major grief moments in my life and you know there is no time scale for grief either mm. of like you know like you know it's a decade yesterday that my cousin like a brother died of leukemia he and i were like brother and sister growing up he was three months younger than me and he had a huge impact on my life growing up but also as he was dying we had a lot of conversations that gave me like a huge amount of you know emotional willpower to take action in a space that i was frightened to take action right which was when my ex-husband walked out the fourth time after my conversations with Mark, I realized I couldn't take him back that fourth time and that I had to switch into living for myself, not living for my children, right? Um, and it was directly through his conversation. So the first thing is being willing to do it on your own time scale, right? Not being feeling forced by everybody else. The second thing for me that has become so important is to, I've spent a lot of my life taking action and then getting the feedback from the action of like, well, did I do the right thing, <laughs> right? I'll be like, okay, I'm thinking about this. I'll go out and do it. And then I'll, it'll go for a bit. And then I'll be like, eh, maybe that's not working, but you know. And so what are the space I'm in right now, because I've spent a lot of time in the last four or five months doing a lot more of this kind of somatic embodiment, you know, allowing myself to feel my feelings and use those as a guide, not as the only guide, but to incorporate that with my intellect, which is, I know, strong and powerful and dominant in the way I engage in the world. And to use the feeling, so follow the feeling, right? So, you know, that's how I created our group Prosperous was I just, there were certain people in the group and I liked the way they were engaging. And I was like, hey, do you want to have a conversation, right? Follow the feeling rather than being all logical and like, why would they want to do that? They're all, blah, blah, blah follow the feeling, mm, right? Mm. I'm just going to follow the feeling and see what emerges and use that as a source of data, a valuable source of data, a useful source of data, and not just the, the kind of intellectual overthinking piece that is my natural tendency is to think my way through the situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So doing stuff on your own time scale. Mm -hmm. combining feelings and intellect but really paying attention to the feelings mm -hmm. which, is, which is something that you know may, maybe there's someone listening to this who's like I'm really good at this but like most of us are you know that's something that we even you know I'm speaking for mm -hmm. myself too like it's a thing that I need to intentionally say okay let me just let me just intentionally go look at the, mm -hmm. the feeling and mm -hmm. okay this isn't feeling right or it is it is feeling right is is that you know is that okay quick question about feelings mm -hmm. um because uh you're a parent, I'm a parent, we know mm -hmm. what it looks like for people to follow their feelings, <laughs> <laughs> little, little people. Um, and sometimes we act like little people when we're like, you know, just there's like this big feeling of like, I don't want to or, 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 or I do want to like, I just, I just, I just want to, I just want to. Um, how do you know how to, how to know which, which bucket the, you know, the, the feelings are in, like, pay attention to this one, or notice this one integrate it but do not act on that feeling <laughs> right so part of that again is is the practice of noticing so for, for me it would when i first started doing this work on myself and started helping my clients with this it was often retroactive you know we would take a situation where we had sort of had a feeling and we thought maybe i should do this but you know but logic says i should do that and you'd follow follow one part and then stuff blows up and you're like, mm, maybe I should have, right? And you do this sort of thinking back over, right? So one of the things that I found useful in doing this work is doing some of that reflective practice, right? Of like, when I have or haven't followed that gut feeling, has it worked for me, right? Mm. And then as you get more practice at doing that, you start to notice. So a sort of concrete example, I. I'm trained in Ayurveda and a large part of my training was leading people through cleanses. And depending on your energetic profile, you'd do a different kind of cleanse for your body. 
And what would people would notice was what they what they started to change their cravings around. Was it sugar or you know carbs mm. or whatever it was that they were craving? And so when people would say things like I'm craving sugar, carbs, you know, I would say, we, like let's talk this through and work on it. Like well, how have you been eating? Versus your body craving steak or spinach, right? If your body's craving steak or spinach, that's probably the information that you you need iron, right? Or if your body's craving salmon, you probably need omegas, right? So <laughs> starting to connect the dots between your the pull and what you know about that pull, right? Yeah. So when you, we know that when we get pulled towards sugar, whether it's alcohol or processed carb, we get pulled into that space. And we know that it's, you know, the model I was given was, you know, it's the race car versus like the trusty old, you know, Volvo station wagon, right? The, the brown rice will get you there in a nice, strong, energetic, you won't crash. You know, the white rice will, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. You'll crash, right? So part of it is it's it's practice, right? It's a little bit like, you know, figuring out your keystone habit, which I do a lot of work with on my clients, is that often it's not immediately obvious. You have to gather the data and explore and, and learn to connect the dots. I have, I have so many, there's so much there. Um, <laughs> quick, quickly, can you, can you elaborate? What is a keystone habit? Sure. So a keystone habit is, you know, the keystone arch, the keystone is the one in the middle that if you take it away, the arch crumbles. Mm -hmm. So your keystone habit is the habit that when you figure it out, it tends to precipitate the following through of other habits. So for example, if your keystone mm. habit was sleep. Was what? Was sleep. Like if you got your seven, eight, nine hours of night yeah. of sleep at night and you notice that when you slept, you would go into your jujitsu, you would eat your healthy green smoothie, you would be less reactive with your kids, et cetera, et cetera. That would be your keystone habit because you would, all the other habits would good, 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 right? Right. And often when we're trying to figure out our keystone habit, the best way to notice it is when we stop doing it, right? So we're <laughs> traveling, we've got guests in town, we've got COVID, whatever it is, and you stop exercising your sleep gets derailed you stop eating the food that you know nourishes your body you stop meditating journaling having your daily walk where you don't talk to anybody whatever it is that you do regularly you don't you suddenly notice gosh i haven't done that for a week and i'm that, pissy i'm yeah. angry i haven't worked <clears throat> out i'm eating donuts whatever it is right yeah yeah no i mean you you nailed it with with me i i definitely now, now it, it actually sleep and jujitsu. Like if, if those things, if I'm doing those things, sleep is probably the keystone habit. Mm -hmm. Is is that a keystone habit for a lot of people? Is that kind of? Yeah. Sleep is a keystone habit for a lot of people. Meditation or some kind of reflective practice where you're not consuming information and you are mm. processing, digesting, taking care of your mind and movement. Those tend to be often like really key ones for people. Interesting that they're all sort of body uh, related. Some, something you said before that I kind of want to get back to, um, there's like a really beautiful nugget in something you you said earlier that I just want to uh, name here is is that um, one of the ways that you can uh, that you can start to or go through a period of transformation is to just start to to notice, just notice what actions you're taking. No judgment, no, just mm -hmm. like, okay, these are the actions that I'm taking. This is how I reacted when my kid did this, when my partner did this, when, you know, what, you know, when the people at work did this, these, this is, this is how I'm acting and how I'm behaving. And then to also just take that and say, so how has that served me in the past? How, how, yeah. Has it served me in the past? Yeah. You know, what, what, what is the result? I'm, you know, if I'm, I guess I'm not talking to somebody who's like 15, but like, you know, somebody in there, 20s, yeah. 30s, somebody who's lived a little bit of life to say, okay, yeah. well, uh, how has this served? And maybe, maybe it's not a negative, but it's not really getting somebody where they, where they want to go. Uh, I, I like that idea of, of just sort of, again, it's that right brain thing, kind of stepping back and going, well, let me just sort of look, how does, what is this, what does this actually look like? If I'm, if I continue mm -hmm. these actions, where does that go? If anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, the other the other aspect that I would that I would add in to to that process, and I think you, you know, I think you you also do this is is the process of saying, okay, we're stepping back. Maybe this is kind of where it's going. Like, where do you where do you think you might want want to be? Okay, maybe yeah. here. Like, what what is the action that that person, you know, that imaginary exactly. person in your future would take now yeah. to to, yeah. to start 
getting there. I, I actually, I had this, uh, one of my deep dive sessions with someone the other day and it's so funny. Like, uh, she, she had a number of goals and we, and we had talked a couple of months ago and she booked the session for now. And so between now and then she, you know, uh, things had sort of evolved for her at, at, at work and, you know, with her, with her social life where she lives. Um, and, uh, it was funny. She said to me, uh, after the session, a couple of days after the session, she said, you know, I, I, I knew that I was working towards X. I was working towards this, this series of, of moves and decisions and everything in August, what really clicked in for me is the things I can be doing literally right now. It's not that I'm like mm -hmm. waiting and then, okay, in August, I'm going to suddenly be a different person or, you know, get, get a raise, get a promotion, get a different job. And now I'm different, but there's things that I can do right now that seem mm -hmm. very small, but as we know with habits, it's that sort of like you change the trajectory like this. And over <laughs> time, it's a big, right. it's a big lift. So that visioning, connecting it with, mm -hmm. right, you're nodding a lot. So I said, <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. Because that's what I do. So I help people create that big juicy vision and connect their daily habits, right? And it's and it's an iterative process, right? We change where we want to go. We change our habits. We move and we morph, right? It's not so. If you, I love the whole vision board and creating all of that, but it's not static, right? Part of it mm -hmm. is, as you say, it's this process of reflection and taking care, you know. And in that space, one of the things that I think is really critical when we're in a state of transition is who are we surrounding ourselves with? Mm. Because, mm. you know, that's one of the things I talk a lot about with habits, you know, and there's so much out there about like, you can create a new habit in 20 days. And then people are like, oh my God, I'm a failure because I haven't done it in 20 days. Because we don't live in a freaking vacuum. We live in these complex, complicated lives with environments and multiple relationships and pandemics and what's going on in Israel and et cetera, et cetera, that massively impact how we show up. And if we are hanging out with people who should on us, who force the state of masturbation, who say, and what's next, what's next, what's next? Or how can I fix you? How can I fix you? What do you need? Rather than hanging out with people who go, do you just need me to hold space so that you can talk? Mm. Would you like some solutions or ideas or suggestions? Would you just need a hug, mm. <laughs> right? Like hanging out, thinking a lot, you know, with the average of the five people we spend the most time, right? Yeah, I so forget who said that was the cover. It was um, uh, Jim Rohn, Jim Rohn. Um, and so that is really important. You know, when I started with you today and we did that heart, right? We were working on aligning our hearts, getting our hearts in coherence. Right, just that's heart math. Yeah, just before the, the call, that's the right? That's reason I'm not a total blockers <laughs> right now. Right. And that, you know, we're getting into heart alignment. We're getting into energetic coherence, right? We're looking at how our heart rate variability comes into alignment together as humans. And that mm. creates a sense of connection and right. When we surround ourselves with people who have that self-trust, who listen to their intuition, it allows them also to hold space and listen to the intuition of those around them right and so that's something that's really important is when you're in a state of transition if you don't know yet where you're trying to be surrounding yourself with people who are kind and thoughtful and reflective and will you know not just throw things on you but say what is it that you need and ask you questions rather than trying to fix you and say you're stuck let me help you get through this problem you know is not helpful right so you know we really cognizant of the people we spend the time with. And I see mm. that so much in my work when people start to change their habits, they're changing their identity because we judge people, group people, associate people, stereotype people based on a lot of their actions and behaviors, which is what habits are. And when mm. people start to change their habits, the people around them start to notice that, right? And you'll either get the people that are like leaning in going, you know, like in When Harry Met Sally, aging myself here i'll have what she's having right yeah. <laughs> right I <laughs> like remember, yes please. i remember it well <laughs> right or the or the like i'm frightened by the changes you're making because you no longer have predictable actions and behaviors in the way that you used to and right. i'm going to condemn you make you feel shitty pull away you know so that's the other thing, like in life in general, but particularly when you're in a moment of transition, is being around people who are not trying to 
force their agenda or try and fix you and keep you online with allowing me to be in my own cans of time is so key. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole other, other conversation to be had. There. <laughs> uh, I, the, the, what, what, the, where that takes me is this, um, this idea that I've worked with, uh, this idea that you know we've we've created our lives are you know we we essentially are a puzzle piece that fits in our you know in our life in some in mm -hmm. some way and mm -hmm. when we decide that we want to be different better more you know whatever more more authentic to ourselves our puzzle piece shape is going to change mm -hmm. okay yeah. so the pieces that we've you know built around us that fit you know no longer fit and those pieces can either like you said kind of be flexible and hold space for us and say okay you want to be here. We got you. Like, we're going to mm -hmm. change, you know, we're going to change around you. And then there's going to be some pieces that are like, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm rigid and I'm not going to change. And, and that's where, you know, things like our energy audits and other things that we do start to come into play where we say, okay, for me to have the space and, 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 and mindset and time to really live into this, you know, way of being person that I want to be, you know, forget the woo stuff. Like I want to be a better person. I want to be less reactive. I want to, you know, not yell when my, you know, kids do something or when, you know, something happens. So for me to do that, um, you know, I need the pieces around me to be able to hold that space. And I think that can be done in lots of different ways through either conversation or action. But, you know, the, the flip side of that is that there's going to be some pieces that, that don't. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and I think we have to be okay with that. Right. You know, and I think we, you know, so often you have these like, you know, bros before hoes and like girl, girlfriends never end and like all of this like BS around how friendship lasts forever and, you know, relationships don't, which I, you know, I've had to let go of friendships over the years when I've, you know, stepped into a new state of self knowing and going, you know what, I don't want to be friends with somebody who all they do is complain because that drags my energy down and they're not taking action. And fine, we all bitch and complain and moan. But like, if you are not going to take action, then all you do is complain to me. I don't want to be your friend. Like, I find it exhausting, right? Yeah. Or you're there. a friend that always takes from me, but never gives, right? I had this friend who was always like, can you pick up my kids from school? Oh, you're at the grocery store. Please buy my, my dog some food. Can you do it? But it was never reciprocated. And it got to this point where I was like, I'm the one that's always giving. And this feels depleting, right? And so allowing ourselves to kind of break out of the like model that this has to last forever, right? And that we can flip and change and take care of ourselves and let go, right? Yeah, I've, I've been writing some some notes on the side. I think I think there's a few really great nuggets here for me about, you know, when it comes to transformation, things to sort of keep in mind are, you know, doing things on your own time scale, um, mm -hmm. really paying attention to feelings, not in a way that's that's judgmental, but just in a way that's like, okay, so what are the feelings that I'm having? Is there a reason? Is there something that I'm trying to, is there something that I need or want that I'm not getting? And and then this idea that um, that we need uh, a support system, you yeah. know, uh, even if that's, even if that's one person that we're saying, okay, I, I think that I want to become, I mean, you and I had this conversation on WhatsApp the other day, where you asked me a really great question about, you know, what it was what it was that I wanted and what it was that I needed. And I was able to, in that space, really come to some sort of big conclusions about what it is that I, you know, who it is that I want to be. So thank you, first of all. Um, <laughs> and, and I just, I, I would invite and encourage like anybody who's listening to this, think of that, like, think of that one person, maybe just, maybe it's just one person. It doesn't have to be like a whole team of people. Like who's the one person that you could go to and say, I really want to be, more like this. I really want to actually develop this skill or this mm. better habit mm -hmm. way of being around, around like the person that I really want to be. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not, no one, no one's broken. You're just, we're all just changing. We're all just learning right. about ourselves and changing. Right. What, yeah. would, what would you, what would you leave our, again, just huge, vast numbers of, of listeners with, uh, <laughs> with today? So um, I see the picture of Einstein, I believe, behind you. Yes. That's a, that's and a painting. Yeah, I made that painting. painting. Amazing. Oh, my God, I love it. Um, <laughs> hang out more in your house with you, by the way. That's Next so time fun. you're in Brooklyn. I, for real, yeah. 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 We got yeah. it we have um, on, the, on the calendar. <laughs> I, um, 
There's a story about Einstein that when he would get stuck with problems, rather than trying to force himself through, he would pick up the violin. And the violin gave him that sense of forward motion, that sense of expansive creativity, and then he could reorient back to the, solve the problem. So I think the kind of big takeaway from all of this is that all of this work that you and I and all of these sort of coaches that we are around that are helping people in states of transformation, there are lots of tools and mindset and practical habits and you know visioning and all of those things to do. The communities are all really important. But one of the most important things is to give yourself grace and not try to force it. And I think one of the things that is really interesting, and I forget where I read the study, but there was a study done recently on the concept of the hustle culture mm. and how that, and I see that with my 20 year old, the conversations I've had with my 20 year old and his friends is they have a much, much stronger concept around the value of friendship and life and time off and travel and exploration rather than this like, hustle, 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 and work, 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 you know, until I die, right? Yeah. And yeah. the statistics, and on each of the generations in terms of yes the hustle culture is the way to live massively drop as the generations get younger and so you know thinking about the model of einstein and all of our conversations is give yourself grace be kind to yourself right allow yourself the space to go that's a beautiful ending i think i do like to ask everyone how can people what is the best way people can find you find you know learn from you work with you what what are the ways that people can find you find me on linkedin tamsin aster or facebook tamsin aster and you can check out some of my videos and regular writings and you know get some freebies and then have a conversation about working with me one-on-one -on -one or in my program called habit magic 101 or have me come and do a workshop or training at your organization because that's one of my juicy fun things. I'm really good at facilitating conversations that transform people's lives. Yeah, we'll post all of those links in the show notes. And I'm saying that here so that when I re listen to this, I remember to do it. Um, thank you again for being on the podcast. We are in the process of um, getting a new sort of uh, podcast publishing thing going. So um, I hope that by the time this comes out, you can listen to The Art of Transformation on many different services, uh, including um, including Spotify, including Apple Podcasts, and many and many others. We're also going to be posting these on YouTube. So maybe you're seeing this already in one of these places. And if you are, I would love it if you did all the liking and subscribing and everything else you're supposed to do. Um, and I'd love to hear from you if you got something out of the podcast. If there's something that you would love to share, send me a message. I respond to everything. And um, thanks again, Dr. Tamsin Aster. It's been so lovely having you. Thank you so much for creating the space to ask me questions, which creates deep reflection and transformation in me too, Mark. My pleasure. Oh man, I loved that conversation with my friend, Dr. Tamsin Aster. And if you enjoyed it as much as I did, please do all the things, like and subscribe. And if there's an insight that you get from this podcast or any of the episodes, if there's a, something you realized, something you learned about yourself, something you're excited to go do now, I would love to hear about it in the comments. I love get, hearing what the impact is on the world around me. So if there was an impact on you, I would love it if you shared it in the comments. Until next time, thanks so much. I'm your host, Mark Sheff, Coach Mark. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.